Putin says very nice things about me. I think that's very nice. President Xi is a uh, terrific guy. I like being with him a lot. Uh, and he's a very special person. Putin declares a big portion of the Ukraine, of Ukraine. Putin declares it as independent. I said, how smart is that? We're like a rocket ship. It was like a rocket ship sent by Kim Jong-un. He's not uh, so fond of this administration, but he's fond of me. And we had a very good relationship. With Valentine's Day coming up, find someone who looks at you like Donald Trump looks at, well, any authoritarian leader. Trump's love of dictators is no secret, and he claims they love him, too. You heard him in that last clip there as part of his case for why he should be elected to a second term. But he might be mistaken about just why they love him so much. Here's John Bolton, his former national security advisor, on why dictators have praised Trump so much. I don't think they... Uh, are really friendly with Donald Trump. I think they think Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, Kim Jong-un and others, they think he's a laughing fool. And they're fully prepared to take advantage of him. Trump's self-absorption makes it impossible for him to understand that. If you weren't already terrified about the implications of a second Trump term, in a new book, Bolton cautioning, quote, in no arena of American affairs has the Trump aberration been more destructive than in national security. His short attention span, except for personal advantage, renders coherent foreign policy almost unattainable. I believed before becoming national security advisor that the gravity of Trump's international policy responsibilities would discipline even him. I was obviously wrong. If his first four years were bad, a second four will be worse. Joining our conversation, senior correspondent at Vox and author of The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America, Ian Milheiser. Paul is also here with us. I mean, to say he was wrong is a little bit of an understatement there, Paul, but let's go to the caution about a second term. Pretty alarming stuff. Yes. I mean, President Mayhem 2.0 is alarming, especially given the state of affairs in the world that we just covered and you cover every single week. I mean, Trump is the number one national security threat for America. I think we've been talking about it on this show for years. Insiders are recognizing it, but I also think America's starting to recognize it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the stakes are different this time, and I think in, in New Hampshire is a bit of a caution for Trump. And you saw independents in particular leave him and go to Nikki Haley. I think that will reflect in the general election in November as well, when independents look at this global landscape and they say, we need stability, we need a calm head, we need someone who's not reckless and potentially collaborating with dictators. I may not like Biden, but he's better than that. I think this is starting to add up on, on him, and I think it's going to hurt him in the general significantly especially because Ian, you, you got to listen to trump in his own words to to hear what it is he plans to do john bolton points out that trump is focused on dismantling the administrative state uh, or the career federal employees trump believes obstructed his agenda when he was president if trump were to be successful right what would that then mean from a foreign policy perspective how would our allies how would our adversaries look at us so I think that what Trump wants to do is take the United States government, which is supposed to act in the interest of the American people, and that has all sorts of systems in place to make sure that it does so, even if one official isn't, you know, is, is selfishly motivated, and dismantle all of that. And, you know, I think the biggest challenge facing people like me who believe that a second Trump term would be uniquely dangerous is that there was a first Trump term. And while it was bad, it did not end in Trump's brown shirts rounding us all up and putting us in camps. But the reason why I think the second term will be different is, first of all, he'll be emboldened. He will have beaten all of his legal challenges. Second of all, he will be surrounded by sycophants. You know, you have groups like the Heritage Foundation that are actively trying to recruit Trumpy people. People to make sure that he doesn't have people as advisors like John Bolton, who, while very conservative, were ultimately not Trump sycophants. And third, the courts are going to be much more friendly than Trump. You, you know, when Trump took office, he still had a Supreme Court that was moderately conservative that would strike down a lot of what he does. Now he has an extremely conservative Supreme Court. And for each day that he spends in office, he can put more sycophants on the, on the federal bench. 
Paul, a democracy expert we often have on this show, Ruth ben Giad posted this on social media, quote, Bolton is correct, but he also opted to work for someone he knew had those sympathies. Why not interview experts on authoritarianism who did not work for authoritarians? That is also a plug on my part to buy Ruth ben Giad's book, Strong Men from Mussolini to the Present. I think implicit in there, though, is this question of will anyone listen, right? Are there Republicans who will listen to a John Bolton? because he did serve in the administration. Yes, I think there are. And folks think there may be no more reasonable Republicans, but they are out there. And, and there are moderates, and there are young people who are voting for the first time, and there are independents that are 49 percent of the country right now that tend to focus on national security issues and tend to consider themselves patriots. And if you can just move a couple thousand of them in Ohio and other key swing states, that may be the difference in who the next commander in chief is. So I do think you have to double down on that. At the same time, you've got the sycophants falling in line. You've got DeSantis and the others who we now see are just going to fall fall in line behind him and give him that momentum. So, yes, I don't think you give up the fight on that middle because the middle is the key battle zone in all of this. Ian, earlier in that interview, John Bolton pointed out that there were, by some chance, there were relatively few international crises that arose requiring an American response during Trump's presidency. Now Putin has invaded Ukraine. We are on the edge of a wider war in the Middle East. It begs the question, what would all that mean then if Donald Trump were president again? Well, we did have one huge international crisis under Donald Trump. We had the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, my recollection was that Trump spent it telling us to do things like inject ourselves with bleach. So, you know, we know how he responded to that crisis. I think ultimately what we need, I mean, there's a name for the kind of coalition we need to build to beat Donald Trump. It is a popular front. And that means that you need everyone in the United States who agrees, who believes in democracy, regardless of whether they're liberal or conservative, if they're Democrats or Republicans, if there's someone like John Bolton who has done terrible things in the past for this moment, does not matter. We need everyone to join this popular front who wants to, you know, who wants to make sure that our democracy is um, is preserved. That includes people who disagree with Joe Biden from the left. You know, because, again, he is the only vehicle to preserve American democracy right now. And then once we get through this present crisis, once we get through this authoritarian threat, then the popular front can splinter and we can return to our ordinary politics. Well, Paul, Bolton tried to claim that America was equally safe or unsafe under either a Trump or a Biden presidency that would seem to undermine the credibility of his argument. Yes. I mean, I'm not, you know, putting personally a lot of, of, of stake in what John Bolton says, but I think there are some people who are moved by him. And I think the question is, can the Democrats and can all those forces that oppose uh, Trump weaponize it in some way? We talked on this show in months past about Chris Christie. Could he take chunks out of Trump over time? Trump is like Godzilla, you know, rampaging our future and rampaging our democracy. So I think it's right that we have to align every opponent to him to try to take him down. And if you can take little pieces off of his vote, voting base, if you can take pieces away from his earned media, if you can take pieces away from his electoral votes, you got to do it because the, the margin may be so small that that's the difference.